Uh, once again, welcome to Passive House Marketing 101, a uh, FIAS webinar that um, we have partnered with James Gepner with uh, Erase40.org um, to bring to you today. Um, before I introduce James, a few things to note. This uh, session is being recorded and will be available via email after the session is complete. You'll get a follow-up email from this service so you can watch it at your leisure. Um, in addition, we are broadcasting uh, from the Midwest and the East Coast. Uh, we are experiencing some weather issues as far as a severe cold, which has been inhibiting some of our connections. So. Uh, we're going to try our best to make sure that this uh, connection goes smoothly through the entire hour. If anything is lost or if um, a connection does get delayed at all, we'll be sure to make sure that you get the information you need. This webinar does qualify everybody uh, who is looking for CPHC CEUs. Uh, for one CPHC CEU, um, they'll, they'll be self-reported after the webinar, and the link and verification code will be shown at the end of the presentation. Uh, do not fret, you will also receive a follow-up email with that information in case you didn't catch it during the presentation. If you have questions during the webinar, we're going to try to answer them at the end of the hour. Uh, feel free to use the question button on the right side of your screen. Uh, that is where you can ask questions and we will try our best to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. Um, but of course, uh, try to stay uh, within the hour to make sure we're conscious of everyone's schedules. So please uh, remind, be reminded that uh, you can, you can uh, ask questions there. If uh, you don't get a question answered today, we will try our best to get back to you if it's especially an urgent question. So those are our logistics today. Uh, we have James Gepner on the line. He's the executive director of Erase40.org. Erase40.org uses behavioral science to speed the adoption of climate safe and zero emission buildings using evidence-based processes. Erase40 also offers programs that focus on a specific decision maker, be it developers, lenders, home buyers, or renters to make it easier for them to choose a zero emission building. So James has been working for several years evaluating this passive house market or zero emissions market. He's been speaking to architects and builders and professionals about their trials and errors and has been compiling this information uh, to better understand what the need is in this market. Um, he'll obviously be sharing this, some of this information with you today. He's very, very passionate about sharing this information. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the mic to James. Thanks, Anissa, um, and thanks to Fayez for putting this thing together. Um, Anissa has got, had to go to um, uh, extreme lengths to um, to um, put this thing together, considering all the sort of uh, technical obstacles we have. So I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, so um, because there's a lot to get through, I'll just start to dive right in. Um, here's a quick summary of what we're going to discuss today. Um, uh, this is basically the marketing pathway um, and, um, or I should say, the marketing pathway. We'll talk about the end game. Uh, go over a framework for understanding and disentangling some of the things that go on when you meet with a prospect um, and establish, try to establish a standard for what needs to occur in that meeting um, so that you get a sense of like, okay, this is, you know, this checked off everything that needs to happen um, to push them towards a decision towards passive or zero energy. And then basically see what's, um, lastly, kind of see what things are within our control. You know, we know um, all the different obstacles with lenders, appraisers, um, you know, different pieces of misinformation out there, but we'll actually, you know, this is the whole point of this is to come, here are the things that we can do. Um, you know, if if if, um, if I were being told this information, one of the questions I have is like, you know, where did this come from? And so just a little background on that. 
um, this information has come from, you know, probably now hundreds of conversations with architects and builders um, that have, you know, shared with me and others at Erase 40 what has been working and what hasn't been working for them. Um, things that I've learned at various conferences and local FAIS meetings, um, sitting in on meetings with prospects and clients, um, and in, as well as industry reports, papers, studies, um, peer-reviewed behavioral research, behavioral models, social science, things like that. Um, also, I should add that you know my motivation in this, um, this is a question that frequently comes up. Um, and um, one of the things just with my background in, in working with you know, consulting or working with larger companies is that you quickly see that the people who can access certain kinds of um, expertise or get help with problems tend to be companies that are like, you know, $500 million a year in revenues or over. And if you're smaller than that, there tends to be just no help whatsoever. Um, that always galled me because, um, uh, you know, frequently the greatest work is being done um, at smaller companies and newer companies, not those giant incumbents. Um, and I've always wanted to kind of be able to bring that to smaller companies. And then when I attended my first um, FIAS conference years ago, I was just um, extraordinarily impressed by the fact that the architects and builders I spoke to, um, there's just no BS. It's like, here's what we're trying to do. Um, this is important. And there was skin in the game. This wasn't a group of cocktail party uh, environmentalists. It was people that really wanted to make things happen. Um, so that was that covered off a major issue for me. And I thought I can put um, I can make an investment here. So here is the um, you know the very basic you know I'll start with the basics um, the basic marketing funnel. Um, identifying the populations, hit awareness whether that's awareness through um, you know social media, whether that's awareness through Google ads, um, you know, um, any number of, a number of strategies that you use, um, the contact, the meeting, all the way to contract. So each of these stages, I just put this up there as um, kind of a reference point. Each of these stages can be examined individually to see um, what the effectiveness um, is of that particular stage. And here are some metrics to account for that. Now, the reason these are important is because obviously builders and architects are frequently in small or mid-sized firms, and um, you're both, the way I think of it is basically um, the people at the head of those firms are both a product specialist, obviously, um, but also playing the role of CEO. And this is, this puts like an impossible burden um, on the architects and builders. Um, and so it's very difficult to um, accomplish all things. And so I just want to put some sort of metrics forward. If you're simply looking at things through the lens of the CEO, this is one of the things that the CEO is trying to do. Um, if we think of that person as a separate individual, CEO's job is to make those systems, put those systems in place um, and make sure your plate as a product specialist is full so that you're constantly um, having the work that you do best um, and um, as much of it as, as you can handle. Um, at all times. So the end game, to me, this is a pretty important notion just um, put out there. Um, you know, my view is that um, that we can and should be um, at capacity in terms of number of projects per year. Uh, I don't think that this is as either an unrealistic goal, but I also think that if we're you know, if we're setting sort of a goal, what other goal is worthwhile? Um, what other goal makes any sense? Um, when we think about it, um, the number of um, the size of the potential market, and we think about the number of builders and architects who um, are trained in Passive House, um, and the value of the outcomes, this should actually be a completely reasonable and attainable goal, but we'll talk about that more later. So for there to be any goal, just we have to consider what, how most firms are um, comprised. And so any, any change, any system, whatever is gonna be done needs to basically at least satisfy all these considerations. It needs to be effective, needs to be low cost. Um, it can't, you know, basically it can't be something where you're expected to hire uh, four new people 
um, to make these things happen to grow your firm. It has to exist within what your firms are currently and what you can do um, currently. Um, when you look at this, however, you know one one um, thing that we need to keep in mind is is you know Johnny Ives at Apple has never been asked to uh, fill out an RFP or update a company website or figure out what market to enter. And you know the reason I bring that up is because there is a tremendous value to the skills that you have, and the fact that you're asked to do something in addition to that seems to me something that's ridiculous. Sure, it's a reality, but there are a lot of people depending on um, your being able to be effective, and those people um, uh, should and must um, help with some of the challenges that you face. So just to, we're going to do a quick overview of some of the challenges and some of the things that you experience on a kind of a daily basis with prospects. Um, Here's just a look at things from the from again from a systems perspective. Um, you know, what I'm going to say, you know, here and going forward is going to be you know extremely familiar to you. But as with a lot of things here, um, we may be putting a slightly different spin on the ball um, that might help um, see the see the challenge a little bit differently. So, any firm is comprised of two machines. One produces clients. The other produces buildings. When you look at it this way, there are a couple of couple helpful things. First of all, you can start to look at things in terms of metrics and just the tracking of metrics um, will help firms discover any number of things about what's going right and what's going wrong with their sales process. Um, the second is, uh, and we'll get this into a little bit, um, you know, later is, you know, how, um, how you feel about, um, about this machine one, the machine that produces clients. I mean, most of the architects and builders that I've spoken to are, you know, it's just like a world of difference between the, you know, what is what they think is the um, the appropriate duties and activities of their job, which is designing and building. Um, the architects and builders I've spoken to and talked to regularly are, you know, engaged in this, focused, happy, um, and then when dealing with prospects, may, you know. Obviously, we all vary, um, but um, you know, even the extroverts among the architects and builders are frequently baffled and frustrated by their um, connections with prospects. Uh, and I, I, you know, my observation has been that there's an emotional toll here, um, just trying to figure out what people are going to decide to do and how much time is extracted from the architects and builders in some of these conversations with prospects. Um, and the impression I get is, that, you know, if if um, some of these duties could be pushed off to someone else, they gladly do it. So the client machine, this is where our focus is going to be. Um, and currently right now, um, obviously a, a population goes, a population comes into the machine and the output is, as far as passive house goes, more no's than yeses. Um, if we put that into a context or, or, um, or Look at it through a different lens. You can see that this is strange behavior. Um, if I'm a, if I'm a CEO of a startup and I offer all the employees stock options at no cost to them, and the stock options could potentially be worth a couple hundred thousand dollars, I would think it'd be pretty weird if everyone said no thanks, or if most people said no thanks. And I think that's kind of the way we need to see some of the behavior that we witness on the part of prospects. So what's behind this strange behavior is a difference between perceived and actual value. Um, and we'll come back to this a lot. Um, basically, the delta between the perceived and actual outcomes uh, the, or the value of those outcomes is enormous. Um, another way we can even see it is, um, you know, many of you have had an experience where you talk to people who you've built a passive house for and how they feel about it and compare that to how the prospect feels about it and then the questions that they ask. The degree of commitment to those outcomes and the value placed in those outcomes, what this house that you just produce, um, what it does and how it affects your lives are completely different. Um, and, and this, you know, again, comes back to perceived versus um, actual value at the time of the prospect decision. Also, I should say that, you know, this value isn't something, this value isn't wishful thinking. It's not, I like these houses. It's not, 
oh, we prefer these things because of, of some sort of ethical or moral stance that we're taking. That may be true too. But if you take some of the outcomes, as we'll discuss later, um, and you had a startup for them, Wall Street completely has a way to value that startup, have investors come in, and there's broad consensus on what that, you know, what that value is. There's a practice and methodology about saying, okay, this startup is worth X because it's solving this problem. Passive houses are solving certain problems, and if there's no value assigned to them, or if it's, that value is inappropriately assigned to them at the time of the prospect decision, then they're not perceiving uh, full value. So again, the values in these outcomes here is obviously not a lengthy list, but um, the way to think about it, I think, is um, that people aren't buying a house, they're buying a set of outcomes. Um, and um, you know, when you compare the, when you compare obviously conventional versus passive, it's in the outcomes that you see the profound difference. Um, and again, focusing on that delta is something that we'll do in a variety of different respects going forward. So I should also point out that value does not equal money. Um, you know, of course, money is one of um, the things that we value, but it's only one of the motivators and things that we value. It's how we think of ourselves. It's who we are as a parent, um, our obligations to others, um, our level of optimism. Uh, just as just as an example, I would expect that optimists would pay more for a passive house than a pessimist um, because of the value of the outcomes or a person with a very um, short expected last lifespan would value it less than a person with a very long expected lifespan. So how we view our future is also gonna be dependent um, on, um, or is gonna be involved in how we view the value of the passive house. So how do these things look up close? Um, here are some of the things, again, in, in conversations, what I've observed, you know, this is obviously all these things that you experience regularly. Um, oh, I really like this other house. Um, you know, they start to go down the passive house road because they like what you say, and then they go, oh, but can we use less insulation? They try to cut costs. Um, you know, I really like the kitchen in this old house. You know, my realtor says, you know, frequently just any number of things in that conversation are gonna pull them off um, what you just described to them. Um, again, just going back to this result is that firms don't often build and design a capacity. Um, you know, being pushed through the ringer where you have to actually like build an inferior house than what you want to build, um, and then lots of answering questions and just the uncertainty that you feel when a prospect walks out the door after you've just invested time in a meeting. So, um, you know, here's I want to say um, the kind of beginning of the behavioral science. Um, is it you or is it them? Um, this is this is a false question. Um, and this goes back to the thinking about systems. Um, the behavioral science term for this would be the fundamental attribution error, that we tend to um, attribute um, the, um, a behavior to the person themselves rather than to their surroundings. So is it the person or is it the environment? Is, it a, is the behavior due to factors external to the person? So when the person's indecisive or they say they don't know what they want, or you worry about whether or not you did a good job describing things or wish you had done something better or trying to just figure out how you might improve um, the description of passive house or answer a certain technical question, um, pushing the burden on yourself. And, and both are really, uh, I think, largely incorrect. I think the burden should be shifted away from you. You've been, you know, this crowd is, um, is extremely proficient in, um, describing and the meetings that I've witnessed and the architects that I've, builders that I've met, extremely good at what they do. And um, I think if we look at the context that we'll get more answers than through introspection. So here we'll start to go through some of the systematic and predictable mistakes that the prospect makes. Um, now, this sounds like bad news, but it's actually, I think, good news. Um, Systematic and predictable means, um, yes, most people are gonna be making these mistakes. Um, and because they're predictable, we can develop a plan and do something about them. Um, so again, this exercise would be worthless if we, didn't, if we weren't in the process of finding additional areas where we can exert control. 
Um, so we'll start to go through these. Um, um, I should, I should actually one thing, I just pause there for a second because I just remember one thing. I've been asked the question a number of times, well, what if um, a prospect walks in the door and they already know about Passive House or they even say they like Passive House? Well, from my view that it would be a mistake to treat them any differently than a prospect that has not heard of Passive House because the even if a person walks in the door and says that they like Passive House or is leaning that way, the barrier profile is almost identical to the prospect that um, that has never heard of Passive House. So I don't think that, I, in other words, I basically everything that follows should still be relevant to that, um, to the firms that have um, prospects like that um, and to those prospects. So here's the decision making period. Um, we'll sort of come back to this repeatedly. Um, because uh, you know, here's where our sort of feel. Here's where the errors are made, and here's where the opportunities are. So here's some of the systematic predictable er errors: using price as a proxy for affordability, um, the discounting of um, energy and repair savings, a bias toward the familiar, um, evaluating what is easy instead of what's important. Um, uh, let's see. Let's go down to the next one. Um, not differentiating between the experts' advice. Um, and people who are non-experts. Um, if I if I meet with one of you and then I go talk to an in-law, I should hope that I will weight the information that you gave me more than I'm going to weight the information the in-law told me. Uh, however, that's frequently not the case, um, and that's a problem. So there's also a lot of noise in the decision-making process. Um, and then finally, and most significantly, there's a one-to-one -one pr um, price comparison between a conventional home and a passive or zero energy one. Again, this is a result of what stuff we just described, large delta between perceived and actual value and the prospects choosing inferior outcomes, which they pay the price for over the long term. And then for you, lower conversion rates and fewer passive house clients. So again, what's the play? Um, the point isn't to go over... Um, um, without having a way forward, all the different challenges, it's to go, okay, what, um, what can we do about it? So basically, you know, this crowd knows how to sell houses uh, and knows how to build houses um, and has had any number of successes here. Um, so the skill set is basically already there. However, passive houses just requires a slightly new bag of tricks because there are different, um, there are different forces at play in the decision-making process. So I think the place to start is is right here, which is just you know let's assume that or let's ask the question uh, why isn't the adoption of passive house the usual behavior? Why isn't it just the commonplace thing that occurs? I think those will like help clear our minds. Um, so in every decision, there are promoting and inhibiting pressures. Um, if we look at that red line. Um, they're promoting and inhibiting pressures, and, and that's kind of where things end up. But in order for the person to basically say yes to the passive house, it needs to be in the threshold. So basically what we need to do is decrease um, um, the inhibiting pressures. Sometimes you'll hear this if you've seen this model before, um, the inhibiting pressures is restraining forces. Um, I think it's important to just briefly talk about construction costs in this context. Um, there is... You know, there's a lot of talk about reducing prices, and of course, that um, is one of the inhibiting pressures. But it's one of the inhibiting pressures. So, my view, uh, and I think the research supports this, um, is if um, if there was price parity between conventional and passive, that doesn't necessarily mean that's not necessarily going to be sufficient to significantly trigger the market. There are other inhibiting pressures going on. On the other hand, if there were pricing, if there were price parity, it would put pricing pressure on firms and architects. So I don't actually think it's the strategy going forward. It's yes, you always want to re continually reduce manufacturing costs. That's great. That's important work. Um, but getting the prospect to assign values to the outcomes is ultimately the better strategy. And that can be done immediately before there is any further reduction in construction costs. So basically, I think our measure is how do we reduce inhibiting pressures so that the um, prospect will accept higher construction costs. And then in the future, as things go forward, if we continue to decrease 
um, costs and get to price parity without putting additional pressures or unrealistic pressures on firms so they actually can't charge appropriately for the services, um, you know, we'll have a way to go. So here's what that would look like in just the graphic. Um, you know, we get from A to B by taking taking out some of those restraining forces and we'll get or inhibiting pressures, we'll get to those. So I, I met um, John Pickering recently and had a conversation with him. And then a couple of days later he had, um, I didn't know this was gonna occur, but he had coffee with Daniel Kahneman, um, the Nobel Prize uh, laureate for economics, who is a psychologist that's famous for um, talking about some of the quirks of our uh, mental processes. And, um, and this was the, thing that he dropped in LinkedIn after that conversation, where he's talking about just the model that I showed you. So I just wanted to like, you know, this model is not just something harebrained thing that's pulled out of thin air. So the meeting, who's sitting across from me? Um, first of all, it's important just to establish that, you know, people are not um, cost benefit analysis machines. Um, the difference between um, what people are and, and sort of the way we um, think about people, we tend to think about them or we tend to sort of by default assume that they're more like the cost benefit analysis machine where they can really weigh long and short term benefits, where they can choose a decision with the best out outcomes, where they act you know, more like an algorithm and don't make many errors. But people are anything but that. Um, if they were, there would be no delta between perceived and actual outcomes and we wouldn't be having this conversation because basically there'd be no such thing um, as of now of a conventional house. Everyone would have gone to passive already. Um, so system one, system two, this is also Daniel Kahneman's work. Um, we'll reference this going forward. So system one is automatic. Things are beyond our conscious control or awareness. It's fast, it's effortless, it produces a feeling. If I say, what's two plus two, you don't need to deliberate, it comes immediately into your thoughts. Um, this is an energy uh, saving system that our brain has used to adapt to our environment. Um, it's extremely useful, but it makes a lot of errors. System two is deliberate, it's within our conscious control, but it's slow, it's energy intensive, and we try not to use it so much. So we'd much rather use system one, and, uh, and I, think it's, I think that we use system one like 95% of the time, and system two about 5% of the time. So when you give, you know, I don't, I don't, say, I don't just put this out there for no reason. When you give a, a, a prospect a statistic, you know, you might expect them to um, go through a deliberative process and see how important that is. But it's much more likely that it will be run through system one and therefore have very little impact on them. So our decisions are also bounded by certain limits. We have limited attention. Um, and uh, a limited ability to process information. And that's why um, frequently that giving people some of that very good information, DOE reports, um, different statistics, different um, just readily observable differences between passive and conventional that they don't immediately just convert the person to a passive house. Um, so a decision is a prediction. Um, it's, we are, Every decision is, okay, we expect this to occur in the future. I order the burger instead of the grilled cheese because I think it's gonna cause me more pleasure. Um, but you know, frequently we make bad predictions. And again, um, when we see the, the bad outcomes associated with a conventional house, it's like, that's a bad prediction. It goes back to that decision period. Um, so what procedure are people using um, to evaluate a house? Basically, if we take populations and go, okay, there's a population of people that have mold, water damage, um, asthma triggers, um, frequent maintenance, boiler repairs, you know, furnace replacements, um, then those are bad outcomes. In the decision period, we would rationally go, okay, so what decision, you know, what, uh, what incurred in the decision process to increase the likelihood those people would have those bad outcomes? But that's not what occurs. Um, so, so there's, there's the problem and that's the decision, that's the problem that is, is significant for the prospect because you know they end up with a you know again inferior outcomes. So we're choosing a future. There are a couple of possible futures. We go okay. There's a house. Um, you know we should we should think this. You know future one. What is the likelihood that there'll be mold problems, furnace repairs? Future two, same thing. Future three, and we should go okay. Rationally, future three is the passive house. It has these outcomes. How do I try trace a path from here to there? Um, 
but the futures are distant. The differences between the futures are not stark as they should be, and there's no evident pathway. So in other words, the future is basically barely apprehended. It's hidden in the fog inappropriately so. Um, and, and this is why people don't just go, okay, of course, of course I should choose a passive house. Um, if the futures were imminent and evident, um, and, and we could see the differences and how, and how the, basically how stark the differences were between them, then we'd go, okay, yes, I'm going to do passive. I'm not even going to think twice. Um, so again, here's the bad outcomes versus good outcomes. Those are heavily discounted. So we don't think about them as we should. So here's what, here's the goal. And here's our way forward is to change the decision environment. Again, we tend to think that the decision is based on uh, internal factors attributed only to the individual as opposed to situational factors in the environment. And in the case of the environment, it's, it's you know, there's a, the environment or the context in which the decision occurs is spread out. It's not only what um, occurs inside your office, but we're going to focus there obviously right now. Um, the um, and, and I should just point out that you are also obviously part of that environment, so a big influencer of, of that. So our goal is, um, you know, among other things, to make that future present and immediate and to use um, that prospect meeting, um, everything that's available to us um, to be as influential so that they can choose and value um, the best outcomes and so they can see them as basically immediate enough that they'll influence the behavior. So here, now I'm gonna start getting the specific recommendations um, for what to do in the meeting. Again, just system one, system two, when we use a generality, um, it tends to be um, from a cognitive perspective, expensive, deliberative, and slow. But when we say something specific, it tends to go to generality very fast. So not only is it emotionally resonant, but we can also extract the generality from it. And here, I'm gonna give you an example here, so I'm not speaking in generalities. Um, a, a comfort is a generality. So the likelihood that people will go from comfort and think about what comfort means to them, have that be emotionally resonant, is very, um, the likelihood is very low. Um, however, and also if, it, if they did um, think about what that meant to them in a visceral and immediate way, it would require a lot of deliberative effort. So again, they're unlikely to do it. But if we say walking barefoot on your basement floor in January, then we, the brain immediately goes up to comfort. So it has the emotionally resonant thing, but it also, um, it also can extract the generality from it very quickly. So this goes with the other attributes of passive too, um, you know, whether, it's, um, whether it's reduced repairs, um, resilience, all those things. When we, t when we talk about generalities versus specifics, we basically are asking people to do cognitive work that they might not do. Another thing that should occur in the prospect meeting is to limit the number of choices. Um, one of our um, shortcuts or scripts that we take is when presented with too many options, the frequent choices to take no action. So you'll see indecisiveness. Um, this is one of the dangers of both being presented with too many options. And I mean, too many scenarios going forward. Um, you're in the meeting and it's like, okay, so what's next? And too many, too many um, scenarios are presented so that the choice is, is kind of frozen. Um, we recommend avoiding technical or teaching conversations for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is that the biased unfamiliar is very strong and these conversations can, can cause people to basically sort of trigger that bias. Um, also, you, you know, it can give people information overload um, and, um, and it, you know, basically it's time taken up where it's not a salient question. So you'll be given, of course, there are lots of technical questions, but my recommendation is that um, you say, okay, I, I would, I'll get that information to you and send them either a link to a website or a document, something maybe from the DOE, from some third par party source, is my recommendation, there's other ways to go about it, but some third party source that contains the just unfettered, fully technical document. If they really are curious, let them, um, let them take the time to answer that question on their own. You know, frequently when they're asking these questions, um, it's not because they want to know the answers, um, but because they're trying to resolve some kind of uncertainty that they're feeling, or they're trying to trying to impress you. Um, so this is this requires some more information. I should say a couple of things here. I should pause for a minute. Um, a lot of the um, 
this information is based on a resource that we developed for this meeting. And so some of these are um, some of these are um, excerpts from that training materials. Um, and I should also say that some of these issues, this being one of them, um, is, is a little bit just scratching the surface. Um, because obviously you want to have aesthetic in this case, you want to have conversations about aesthetics. But um, a lot of that should be pushed um, to later in the conversation or to a second conversation for a number of reasons. And one of them is that because aesthetics forces you into price competition. So if you think about the order of events, um, the, the prospect might um, want to have that, will likely want to have that conversation, but let's just say they go, okay, I want to go with you. Once they've made that decision, they're like, okay, I'm going with you, but come on, let's, let's pull back on the price because there's still alternatives available. You haven't diminished the number of alternatives. So when a person starts a meeting um, or walks into a, a situation where they're having a choice between um, some purchase decision, there are any number of um, alternatives available. And basically what, what we want to do is reduce that number of alternatives. So having this decision later in the chronology um, should decrease some of the pricing pressure on, on architects and, and builders. Don't allow the prospect to preempt your process. Think about um, basically the example I'd give is um, walk into a doctor's office. If you walk in there and say your elbow hurts, that's fine. But the doctor at, at that first meeting is going to say, okay, you know, let's get your medical history. Um, and they're going to go through their process because their process um, is how they make the diagnosis. And we go in and we respect that because we understand that in order for them to um, come to the best diagnosis, they need to go through that process. It's the same thing. The, the prospect here is taking your time. You're the expert here. So don't allow them to preempt your process with questions right front. In other words, don't allow them to control the meeting. Sometimes that attempt to control is out of anxiety. Sometimes that attempt to control is to try to get you to believe something about them, like get to believe that they're not a pushover because they have some fear about that. Um, but anyway, don't allow them preempted, sort of gently um, validate their questions. Um, actually, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, listening style. Um, there's a lot to say about this, but the listening style, I think, is a really great tool that architects have. Um, the interview is listening style. Basically, where you just um, um, kind of s flip the switch on your own thought process and just fully listen. And just every time your brain has an opportunity to do more work, you know, rather than associate thinking about what you're trying to say or try to make some speculation about what kind of person they are or whatever the thoughts going on in your head shut that off and just produce more questions so you're like doing detective work that kind of opening listening style will produce a level of goodwill there's of course there's a lot more to say about this but a level of goodwill that will allow you to do some of the course corrections that are required because they're going to of course going to come in the meeting with um with a lot of misinformation or with an absence of information and there'll be an, any number of course corrections so a listening style will give you the the goodwill that you'll be able to do that and still maintain the, the relationship so validating questions again if they start to preempt things um you know what is the typical price per square foot is that important to you ask them a question back um, and then say great we'll get to that but don't let them dictate the order of the information that you give them um, keep an eye out for if you're having that listening style, what's important is you start to listen out for role-based decisions. You know, they'll start to say, as a parent, you'll hear this as a neighbor, um, as an investor, all these things are, oh, investment's important to you. Okay. Well then, um, you know, not necessarily want to necessarily say it in these exact words, but, um, if you look at a conventional house, those energy and repair um, expenses represent a loss over a period of time. Does that comport with who you are as an investor? Easy versus important. When evaluating an item, people tend to focus what's easy and not what's important. So um, this is important for another number of reasons. One is obviously those outcomes are important. And so when you get people thinking about backsplashes or stoves or walk-in closets, that's the, that's that exists or that occurs because they don't have evaluation criteria. Um, obviously, a walk-in closet doesn't make a house, nor does a fancy stove. One response to their bias is that we might, you know, have um, amenity inflation. It's like, okay, let's do a sub-zero. 
things like that, it falls into that trap, but it is a trap. Um, instead, um, being able to go, okay, what's important to you? What are you trying to do with your life? Um, pull them to what those outcomes are and what those outcomes mean to their long-term happiness and welfare. So using language and definitions to frame the choice. This is one of the things that can help bridge um, that divide between um, the present and the future to make the future more imminent. Um, again, in this resource that we developed, we have a number of definitions and here's just a small sampling of them. Um, so a thoughtless house, some of you may have heard me say this before. Um, um, Again, this will be a recording, so you can visit this definition later. So I won't spend a lot of time here because there's more to get through. Um, an energy model is a simulation. Um, and of course, who wouldn't want a simulation? Um, house regret syndrome, get them to think about that future and the future regret of making the wrong choice. Um, you know, as soon as basically regret is imagining an alternative future and remember, remembering the decision that led you there. If you imagine having this regret, you can kind of you know, go, oh, if I, I, I might feel that regret in the future, so let me go back to the present moment and see, am I making a decision that's gonna cause me to regret? And framing things can get people to uh, start thinking those terms. Miswanting, this again, touches on amenity inflation. So that sub-zero fridge, um, you know, evidence is not particularly on this, but it just objects in general have almost a zero impact on our happiness past the point of six months. So a, a new car, various things might affect our happiness for um, for six months, but then we go right back to baseline. So, um, you know, that doesn't mean that people won't be drawn to it, but there are real things that are in those outcomes that will affect people's happiness over the long term. Passive house delivers better air quality, better sleep, reduced noise, all these things have lasting impact on the person's happiness. So again, when they start to go through the process of amenity inflation and think about in excited terms about the sub-zero fridge and the stove and things like that, then just know that this, this falls into miswanting. It doesn't mean that there's a, an easy response to this, but just for you to know about that phenomenon. So to see some of the absurdity of this, imagine you know, you're know you a football coach, it's the fourth quarter of a game and your team's down by three points. Um, and it, you know you go to the Super Bowl if, if your team wins. Um, so you call a timeout and, and figure out what play to call. Do you pass, do you run? So imagine, imagine instead of going through the probability of a successful run or a pass completion, thinking about the probability of interception, the various hazards that might occur, you instead consult a bunch of tarot cards. The reason that's absurd is because the variable has nothing to do with the outcome. There's no tie between the two. So that's what people are doing when they go, okay, I want the sub-zero, or I, I want um, any number of things that they ask for. I want the fancy backsplash. The air quality, the better envelope, the quiet, those are things that are gonna affect them. And those are variables that are connected to their happiness, not some of the things they do. So basically, it's like getting them, laying down a path for them where they're not falling into this absurd situation. So payback period, um, talking about like different shortcuts that we use. This is another one of them. It's easy, but wrong. It's easy to remember. I mean, it, why is it, why is it adopted? Um, I think it's, e oh, it's adopted because it's easy to remember and it's simple math, but it's wrong because it dismisses the outcomes and doesn't take into account the asset value. So it completely produces the wrong um, financial decision and output, it wouldn't pass the test in any kind of financial context. So I don't recommend using it because it, it is a dissuasion to um, adopt passive. Um, just because I, I can see the clock is ticking away, I'm gonna move through things a little quickly. So remember, information isn't enough. We need to think about the behavioral value of things. And when presenting, say, like a DOE report or other piece of information, it's just think, how, how is this gonna change the person's urgency to buy a passive house as opposed to the conventional house. Um, price is a proxy, proxy for affordability. Obviously, you know, using the monthly, total monthly cost is a better way. I think most people are sort of already know this. Um, the other thing to keep an eye out for is bad reference points. We all use reference points in our decisions. And so here's an example. Let's we walk into a we walk into a bike shop and look at a 10 speed and it's a used 10 speed and it's like, oh it's a it's two hundred dollars. And so it's transportation. So we go onto a car lot then and go, you know, we see that the BMW is $65,000. We go, oh my God, it's so expensive, right? This is absurd, right? And the absurdity was um, the thing that facilitated the absurdity 
is that we use transportation as a guise. So this isn't so, or as a, some label over um, as an umbrella. Now, this is what occurs with conventional passive houses. People try to make comparisons between the two, but when you look at the outcomes, there are no comparisons. Just as it's absurd to call these both transportation because it leads you to a dumb comparison, the same goes with conventional versus passive houses. So how do you sort out this difference? The question put to the prospect is, you know, what are you trying to do? So in this case, you know, are you trying to commute in Key West and exercise, or are you trying to commute 20 miles in Maine? As soon as you go, what are you trying to do? They both have sharply different outcomes, and you see that one works and one doesn't. Therefore, there cannot, one does not serve as a valuable reference point. Um, so when people go onto MLS and look at a existing house for sale that's you know a conventional home, then going, yeah, I, kn I know that's the conventional home, but what are you trying to do? Because if you're trying to do this other thing, then that doesn't serve your interest, and that that's dismissed as a um, that's dismissed as an alternative, and so it doesn't serve as a good reference point. So they'll unconsciously come up with reference points. We all do. This is a bias. It's not something that's changeable. It's hardwired. But if you explicitly addressed it, address it and go, oh, I see that you know, you've looked at other things in MLS, um, but does that improve the air quality for your infant? Um, does that reduce um, the level of traffic noise so that, you, you're, you know, so that your son can study after school? Um, as soon as you go into what, what are you trying to do, they'll see that you know, um, some of the outcomes measure up and some don't. So just remember that losses are better than costs. So when you talk about energy costs, um, I think most people in this community know that that's not a very effective sales strategy. Um, but when you when you just talk about it as a loss, the cumulative number, that $175,000, at $200,000 of net present value of their energy and repair savings, that's what this is. It's losing that money. So talk about the decision itself. It's like, um, as people are touring homes and meeting with realtors, just know that um, deciding not to know is itself a decision. If you don't ask what's inside the walls, that's a decision not to know. And just know that not knowing can bear certain risks when you make a decision. Um, one advantage that passive house um, builders and architects have is just saying, talk about disclosure. It's like, you know, we'll, we'll give you the drawings, we'll show you what's in the walls, we'll show you the skill levels of all the builders um, and go ask the same of of the major home builders and you know make that sharp distinction because that puts the uncertainty in their lap as far as what don't we know from those alternatives again the the way to reduce price competition is to reduce the number of alternatives so don't fall into price competition trap value is discovered at the level of population um, if we have vague representations of people you know think about the custom home market that's really um, doesn't really mean anything we should think we should define our populations as narrowly as possible and think of one person. So as just one quick example, um, a trip to the emergency room. If a, if a father has a daughter with asthma and that um, and that father um, you know takes their child to an emergency room, then because of an asthma attack, then that father does not care about price per square foot. Um, that father is going to have be very connected. It's going to be very salient and, and real to that father about what that improvement in air quality and the reduction of asthma tri triggers. So, if we let me see, so um, so take that in this context. When you're selling wheat or sweet crude oil, um, that's a commodity. There's two pieces of information: volume and price. Now, that's not appropriate here because how the buyer uses the product is important. This is not a commodity market. Um, what the person is trying to do is very important information, and that's it's information that will help um, push the prospect through that decision. So basically, our goal this is to start to sum up is designing good decision environments, and we can do that and get people to reliably cross the threshold again because the value is so much higher between a passive and conventional house. Um, I'll just skip that for now. So here's what occurs: we want to occur in the meeting, and, and again, this is just a pass fail on on whether a meeting worked out well. Um, everything that occurs in the meeting should reduce one of the inhibiting pressures. Um, everything that occurs in the meeting should be salient, easy, connect to outcomes, reduce or minimize buyer, um, barriers, and minimize biases. By the end of the meeting, they should draw a sharp line from the decision to the outcome, and have that, that future should be vivid and tangible. Um, they're presented with the alternative futures. Those futures should, be, again, um, between the conventional and passive, and the difference between those futures should be sharp. 
um, the choice is no longer a strictly an economic one. It's who are you as a parent? Who are you as this sort of person? Um, make pushing people to roles based decisions. Um, talk about alternatives that do not meet their criteria because what are they trying to do? Um, and finally, the comparison between the cost of passive house and conventional house do not seem appropriate. That's basically, that should be the output of, um, of your meeting, your first meeting with your prospect. So ultimately, this is what should be the upshot of, of using these different um, concepts and procedures. And again, we have, a, we have a tool that we've developed that pulls the ideas from it. The tool is called the meeting map that basically tries to produce a system that changes the perceived value. So you know now the perceived value is X and then um, the new procedure should um, um, have an X plus something. So I'll just skip this. This is a lot of information in the slide because I know we have to kind of wrap things up. But here should be the change in perceptions from one procedure to another um, is there is a reluctance to accept the increase in construction costs and where they occur because it's not there's not always a large increase. Um, in the new decision environment, people should be glad to accept that because they understand that the house plays a role in their future. So again, the environment makes a big difference in people's behavior. You know, think of a woman who never sings in public. People think, oh, she's too shy, and all of a sudden she sings. Well, was she too shy? Maybe not. Maybe it was just the environment. So all this has a lot to do with how people value your services as well. Perceived value affects how people perceive your fees. The higher the perceived value, the less pressure there is on your fees. So that's significant. Um, we can just skip this for time's sake. Just as I was going to mention, there's a lot of adoption of these practices among different companies um, right now. So what's next? Um, basically, what I recommend is that you commit to change in the decision environment so that everything meets that standard. Um, you know, think about, make a bet. What are your odds of designing and building to capacity if you change the decision environment and account for what's driving a behavior um, versus what are your odds of designing and building capacity if you do not change the decision environment and, and account for what's driving behavior? And those two probabilities should equal 100%. So um, you can tell where I probably come down on this. Um, but going to the exercise of making a bet and writing down that bet will, I think, clarify your thinking. Another way to make more accurate decisions is not think about from the present forward, but go think about the future and look backwards. In two years from now, you're designing and building capacity. How'd you get there? What steps did you take? So as an exercise, I wish we had time to do it right here, um, list the three or four steps that got you there and write them down. Then when you write, look at those steps, go list any obstacles that you have that may prevent you from taking and following through for that action. So write if then statements, if X obstacle, obstacle, sorry, I'm not being able to speak right now. If X obstacle comes up, then I will do Y. So and over time, my um, prediction is that firms that like address some of these biases um, head on um, and change the decision environments are going to have a cumulative effect in their favor. And firms that don't are going to are going to basically continue to struggle with with things as they are. Um, again, we're pretty much running out of time, but just a last word about um, I'll skip over this for the sake of time. Um, uh, uh, I guess we'll just end here. Um, if anyone wants to follow up with me and ask further questions, um, um, you know, please reach out to me and don't bother even writing me a long email. Of course, you're welcome to, but you can just type in webinar and, and reach out. It's James at Erase40, and then here's the final slide. So thank you everyone for your time. And I guess if we still have time for questions, I know we're running over, um, then um, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, James. Uh, this is the time that if anyone has additional questions, please type them into the question queue. We'll try our best to address um, a few questions with the remaining time we have. Um, we may go one or two minutes over the hour if need be, uh, but also we will try to uh, reach out with uh, some follow-ups to questions that have gone unanswered. Um, please take a look at the screen. This is your verification code if you are looking to earn CEUs for the presentation today. Uh, the self-reporting page URL is above. And um, also, please stay tuned for upcoming webinars by subscribing on our uh, BS newsletter. I'm going to add that link to the bottom in a moment. Um, so I'm going to see if we have some questions in the queue. Oh, here they come, James. All right. So we'll start here. Um,
One moment. Thank you for all the positive comments. So uh, a question uh, from a user. I don't understand why comparing energy costs would not be the strongest argument. So I, I, I skipped over that point pretty quickly. So sorry for not adding further clarification. Um, that The point that I was making there was really about um, how we process the difference um, and how we process costs for how we process losses. So the experience of the builders and architects that I've spoken to is almost um, unanimously that people kind of say, shrug their shoulders, oh, I don't mind my $200, $300 energy bill. Of, of course, opinions vary on that and the responses vary, but the, there is a willingness, um, relatively speaking, to accept that cost, but it is the same thing that $200 cost or $300 cost or more is the same thing as saying a $200,000 loss. And if you frame it as a loss, you can expect that there'll be a stronger response um, of the people. So you're, you're talking about the same subject, you're giving them the same information, but you're framing it differently. And that will have a very different impact on how people process that information. All right, another question here. What has been the line that has shifted previous clients' views? And are they always specific? I mean, so I, I, I think that question, I don't think there is a line because, so I think the assumption underlying that is that you're trying to persuade people I don't think you're, I don't think architects and builders are, are architects and builders in my experience are incredibly credible people. Um, they sit down with prospects and guide them through the questions and they speak in a way that is believable and trustworthy. And that's a really important thing, but there's not a silver bullet to say, here's this line that's going to persuade a person. It's rather think of yourself instead of selling as being an ally to a very difficult decision that's very complex. And as an ally, increasing that person's trust and receptivity in you. And if, if there is a thing to do in that, it's to connect them to the outcomes. And the first thing you want to say, if there's one thing that they need to understand, is that there is a very, very profound difference in how different homes perform. And if they ignore that difference, they take a huge risk in having bad outcomes. And you can be specific about what those outcomes are. Okay, can you recommend some DOE or other technical links to support the self-teaching component of your discussion? Um, you know, this is something that, you know, of course, um, you guys are the experts here. Um, and this is a question that maybe Fias would be better to answer. Um, I, I've saw, I saw a really good page on RDH's site once, and I've seen different pieces of um, um, things from the DOE, but you know, maybe Anissa and I can have a conversation. We can follow up with you about that. That sounds great. We will definitely follow up on that question. We do have some resources and I'm sending some links to the audience as well. There's a few more here that I think we can maybe touch on before um, we'll say goodbye for the day. Some of these questions may be better answered afterward because some of them are applicable for maybe different regions of the United States or world. Here's one uh, for you, James. What's the best way to market passive houses if you only have a limited passive house portfolio or limited projects that are passive in your portfolio? So, so that's a great question. So my assumption is because the market is, you know, in that transition period now, or kind of at the beginning of that transition, that most firms are in that situation. Um, and you know, Erase40 is developing any number of tools to ease the burden on architects and builders to getting people to make that better decision. So we'll have 
tools for um, for your prospects who are developers going forward. Um, we're working on a lender workshop right now, um, and the current um, program that we're launching is the meeting map. So I am, as far as what the best is, I would say use the meeting map. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about what the meeting map is and how it works, um, but we think that'll increase people's conversion rates pretty significantly, and it's a behavioral intervention that should be fairly easy to use. Again, a lot of this information comes from the development of it, um, but, um, but yeah, so my assumption is always that a lot of firms are in the, that particular situation, and and again, the, it's really about what the about what the decision environment is for those prospects. No matter how many passive homes your firm is selling and how many people that you think you can convert, it's getting that system as a, as effective as possible so that you're able to get people to again choose their own best outcomes. Okay, I think there's one more that we can we can do for now. Um, what are some tips that you can offer for in-house marketing people to convince the architects to stop the technical, in quotes, teaching? Um, th yeah, that's a good question too. I mean, I would say um, having them watch this video um, we'll have a lot of information about that, but if you want to reach out to me again, my email address is james at erase40.org. Um, I can, I can answer that specific information. There's any number of barriers to, there's always any number of barriers about why we would do a thing or not do a thing. Um, and so, um, there might be any number of others, um, that I can think about a little bit more, um, if you reach out to me. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you, James. I think we're going to be wrapping up our broadcast for uh, this afternoon. Um, thank you for all your wonderful insight. I see that there are still some questions um, that maybe we can answer and have a follow-up to um, this broadcast. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, stay tuned for future webinars uh, through FIAS. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter. I also added some links to um, erase40.org as well as um, some FIAS links as well. Enjoy your day, everyone. I hope everyone stays warm and hopefully we'll see you next month for our webinar in February. Thank you. Thank everyone for the time.